Hello, hello. Can you hear me? This is weird, speaking on an expo floor. So I'm going to talk loud. And I'm worried it's going to resonate and echo. But OK, so first of all, thank you for coming, to, to coming out to this uh, expo hall thing for this talk. Um, also, thank you for putting up with my talk description, if any of you actually read it. Um, it was a little over the top. Um, I was feeling rushed and I got a little flippant. So I'm going to try and cram a lot into 20 minutes. So it's not your fault if it goes over your head, you miss stuff. Um, it's my fault for being a dick, trying to put so much in 20 minutes. And I think it's being recorded, right? Yeah, thumbs up. So it'll be on the internet someday. Hopefully it'll sound good. What's that? Yeah, yes. Um, OK, so uh, me, and sorry for these screens. I didn't know they were going to be so small. There's another one over there. Um, so my name is Jeff Lindsay. You probably haven't heard of me. And I'm serious. Like, I'm not being facetious. I, pre I stay pretty heads down and behind the scenes, um, despite working on fairly high impact projects. So a couple of them include Docker itself, right? I helped start the Docker project um, as an ind independent collaborator, sort of working on the prototype and was the first user of Docker and built a bunch of stuff in the Docker ecosystem. Another sort of relevant thing to this talk is some 10 years ago, I created webhooks. And so that's, um, and what that means is I came up with the term webhooks and talked about it a lot until people started implementing it. Luckily, some of those people were uh, GitHub and some other cool companies. So in the last few years, I started Glider Labs, which again, you may, might not have heard. We don't have a booth or anything like that. Um, and Glider Labs started as a as a Docker SI, like we were one of the first people to get Docker running in production for people. And then we've sort of transitioned to be a little bit more product oriented, focusing on our open source stuff, which is probably how you've heard about us. Um, so just a, we have a ton of stuff, um, but sort of pre uh, Glider Labs even was Doku, which, has anybody heard of Doku? So it's sort of actually the first killer app for Docker. It was a, uh, this was 2013 or four, some time ago. And uh, it was basically a, uh, a single host version of Heroku, totally Heroku compatible, and you could run it yourself on DigitalOcean or whatever. And, uh, and it was based on Docker. And it was originally 100 lines of bash. And so, it, but it was very extensible and it was very simple, easy to understand. And so for that reason, it's actually still one of the most popular uh, platform as a service open source projects um, for a single host. So there's a couple of other projects, uh, Log Spout, um, stuff that's like top 20 Docker Hub images. Um, Registrator, this one's crazy. This one is um, really simple. All it does is when containers come online, it puts it in a service registry. Um, this has 20, sorry, 200 million downloads. It's on par with the official Ubuntu image um, on Docker. So that's weird. Um, and Alpine Linux, OK. Alpine Linux, which we didn't create, but we sort of introduced it into Docker. How many of you use Alpine? So we um, you know, saw the potential you know, as a great small uh, container, uh, Linux distro that had a great package ecosystem. And so we started using it, and then we created the official Alpine image. So if you use Alpine, you're probably using the one that we maintain. So we've done all of this, uh, and there's basically just two of us. And right now it's just me and Matt. And uh, we had no VC funding. So, and we have no intention of taking VC funding. So we kind of do a lot with very little, and it's because of the community and the way we do things. So I actually don't want to talk about any of that stuff. I want to talk about new stuff, right? Because we're actually changing we're kind of moving up the stack. As you can tell, Docker, the ecosystem is very noisy. It's very, there's a lot of stuff going on. And when you're not VC funded, it's really hard to get people to notice, even if you have great ideas. So we're going to kind of go up the stack and get back to some stuff that I wanted to build for years, 
and actually was part of the motivation for being involved in Docker in the first place. So this talk is uh, basically, it was originally going to be one demo, but now I'm going to give you two demos uh, and some other stuff. But first, dramatic pause, I want to talk about something else. I want to talk about sustainable open source building blocks. So this could actually just say sustainable open source because that's a whole talk on its own. It's an important thing. Uh, it, that's a hard thing we're trying to figure out right now for a lot of reasons. But I specifically want to talk about sustainable open source building blocks. And so probably a lot of you have programming experience and you probably kind of know what I mean by building blocks, right? Libraries, APIs, platforms, developer tools, right? Software building blocks give you uh, leverage in what you can build. Like that's kind of one of the coolest things about software, being able to do more with less, uh, being able to do the same stuff faster, getting new capabilities, right? Just showing you new things that you can build. If any of you have ever read a, uh, a GitHub project um, to figure out what it does so that you can understand what you can do with it, that's kind of what I'm getting at. And this is, some people have described this as generativity, which is actually quite fundamental. It is the difference between these two devices. One of these is, and I think actually literally infinitely more interesting than the other. So software building blocks and our ability to mater basically materialize them out of thin air, to me, is the real magic of computing and software. And so just to make sure that we're on the same page, right, here's some properties of good building blocks. You've probably heard of some of these before, right? Simple. If you've heard does one thing and does it well, there's not too many things on this expo floor that do that, have that quality, by the way. Uh, composable works with other things. In some cases, this just means having an API. This one's important to me, extensible, having hooks, having, being pluggable, sometimes scriptable. Recursive, not in the sort of turtles all the way down, but good building blocks are made of good building blocks. And expressive, which is again, being able to do uh, and, and build more, uh, multiple things with, with this tool. So I'm sure, uh, how many of you have had uh, sort of experience as an entrepreneur or working with an early startup, right? It's kind of, it's, yeah, it's pretty common for people in tech. Um, and if you haven't found out yet, there's this interesting thing about business, right? Business is in the business of solutions, which sounds um, ridiculous. But the, it, what I mean by that is, and, and you've sort of figured this out as, a, uh, as an entrepreneur, right? When you, especially if you read like customer discovery and stuff, um, your whole goal, you're constantly asking yourself, what problem does this solve, right? Um, because you're, you're trying to find, this is what product market fit is, right? You're trying to find that urgent, burning problem so you can provide the solution, right? And sell it for lots of money. The problem is that solutions are not building blocks. And, and again, it's because these are fundamentally different things. It's actually, again, the difference between these two devices. One of these is clearly a solution to an urgent burning problem, right? I need toast. Um, but really, like the, uh, the, the Apple II, a lot of the early PCs, right? We didn't know how to market them. We didn't, really, we didn't know how to like tell people that they, they needed this, right? Everything we know now about the impact of that device, and they were like, uh, it's just a smaller business machine? So, and that's kind of the, the point, right? By design, truly generative building blocks don't have a single obvious use case or a burning problem. And there's probably a few of them, which is already difficult. Like, it's hard to market baking soda. Like, what's that for? Um, when it does multiple things. Um, but what's really interesting about truly generative technologies is uh, the majority of the use cases haven't been discovered yet with it. So um, maybe not a lot of you, but some people are around for the first couple years, maybe first year or two of Docker, um, probably know what I'm talking about. There were all these really surprising, non-obvious use cases for Docker because it was designed to be this primitive. And, and even now, people are still finding really interesting use cases and some of them being demoed here and stuff. 
So the problem is commercialism will always favor solutions over building blocks. Womp womp. And that's why so many things in our ecosystem right now look like this. And the more enterprise it gets, the more it looks like this. And of course, at the end of the day, uh, we end up working with lots of these. And we end up having to duct tape them together. And this is also why Solomon had, has to go out of this. You have to appreciate this. He goes out of his way to push this idea of like the Moby project and all these kits. Because this is not, that's not a normal thing for a company to do, to re-break their solution back into building blocks while selling the solution, right? Because it's so much easier just to sell the solution. Um, so it happens a lot less often. So there, this is, uh, there, there's a lot of other problems. Think this is, you know, it's a systemic thing, and there's so many other things. Like I think VC-funded open source is one of the worst things to happen open source. Um, you also find that even when you succeed as a startup, the thing that you built will probably be destroyed. Um, and Silicon Valley attracts great builders and then silences them. So I know how I sound, right? I'm getting kind of crazy. I should maybe point out... This is... This, uh, <laughs> Very s slow, unhappy face. Um, okay, so this is a bumper sticker idea I had. <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> some people. It is a joke, right? I'm not this communist hippie hacker. Um, I'm just a builder. I'm a, I'm a technology idealist. And my real point is, is that there's a lot of really great, useful software that could exist that doesn't. Particularly good building blocks. And again, building blocks are not just libraries and the things that sort of obviously building blocks, but tools, APIs, platforms. Software as a service is clearly capable of being a building block, right? So this brings me to a particular problem that I'm very interested in and have been for the last 10 years. Hosted services seem to necessitate business, right? There's no open source equivalent for services in the cloud. And it's because they, they take resources, right? You have to pay for them and those resources increase and there's 24-7 operations. That's better suited to a business, right? Open source has... Uh, open source communities have solved a lot of problems that, that companies have in terms of you know, support and, and making great uh, software. But those two things in particular are making it so that open source is not quite suited for this, which is unfortunate. Um, so I pointed this out. Sustainable open source is already very hard. Uh, sustainable open source services is impossible. Uh, so that's the tie-in to the talk title. Um, well, we might have a model that works. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to explain that model. <laughs> but uh, I can show you some of the building blocks that we're building as sustainable open source services. The first one is Command I.O. Have any of you heard of this? Probably not, because it's still a private, private alpha kind of project. Shell commands in the cloud. It lets you do stuff like this, right, where you can use JQ over SSH. You don't have to install JQ. You can just use it um, from any computer that has SSH. Um, but you can also write custom scripts, uh, like to deploy your site or deploy your application, and then share it with the other people on your team. And they can just run it with SSH without installing anything or having credentials set up. And this, by the way, is authenticated with your GitHub username. So it, by default, is using the system user. So in all these demos, there's no username. Um, so here's kind of a, a, a walkthrough of um, the, kind, the things that we can do with it. So uh, hopefully you can see this text. Um, so you build commands with, uh, as local files, like sh regular shell scripts. So using Vim, um, we write a shell script, but it has this extra shebang line at the top, which tells it, you know, what image, what packages to install, and then you just write a, a script. So by default, it says hello world, or it takes the first argument. And this is using bash, but it could be anything. You could install Python and write this in Python. Then you pipe this into command IO create, and we'll call it hello. And then you can just say SSH command IO hello. 
and it runs your uh, thing. You can give it an argument, right? And so now you have this sort of script or this command that you can run from anywhere. Uh, so that's a basic idea. Here's a, a more uh, interesting example, but still kind of a toy example. Um, an API client using curl and JQ. If you've used JQ, um, it's a jQuery uh, uh, JSON uh, processor. So we'll, we'll use Alpine, we'll install bash, curl, and JQ, right, and another bash script. Um, and then we're going to curl the first argument. We're also going to use an environment variable, which we'll get to later, um, called base, which we'll prefix the URL with if it's there. And then we'll pipe this into JQ, right? By default, just passing through, or if you provide a second argument, you can query whatever you got from curl. So we'll create a command, create HTTP. Uh, and now we can use it. We'll use the uh, Slack API endpoint to sort of see the result. There it is. We can do the same thing and do dot OK, the jQuery, the value of OK is true, so we got that. So that's kind of nice, right? Um, you can, we can set the environment. We can set base to the Slack API base URL so that we don't have to type the whole URL. It's just kind of just showing you env environment variables. We could then use the environment to basically reprogram it to maybe use the GitHub API. Um, and in this case, we'll look at uh, the org, the Glider Labs org. So there it is. And like before, we can use the second argument to query uh, that JSON that we got. Showing the name, showing the location. I'm probably in your guys' way, but <laughs> sorry. Um, so, uh, oh, and another thing, we can actually run any of these commands over HTTP and WebSocket. But um, this will use uh, access tokens because you can't do SSH authentication over HTTP. So we make a new token, which is just a UUID, and then we grant access uh, to the HTTP command, um, which you, same as any other user. So this is how you share commands with users. And then, um, and now you can just use curl with that token. And here's the, the run, this is the endpoint for running commands. And it runs just like SSH. It's kind of cool. Um, and same thing, you can, you can uh, you know, provide multiple arguments. And you know, it works just like the SSH version. But it also, like I said, can be, that endpoint can be upgraded to WebSocket. And then you can run these in the browser. So that's pretty cool. So that, that's command IO. Um, and that's all it does and all it probably ever will do, like for the most part. Um, and it's in uh, sort of er, uh, alpha right now. Um, and so I encourage you to play with it. Just go to this URL, request access. It's important to request access now um, and be an early alpha user for reasons I won't get into. <laughs> but um, you will have access to the source. And if you, whatever gets into master is just deployed, right? So that's really neat. So another thing, I'll show you what, uh, one, another, another tool. This is called Buffers. And this one has not been announced. This is the first time anybody's seen this other than Matt. Uh, so text buffers in the cloud. It's kind of like a clipboard in the cloud. So you can pipe anything into it, into the default buffer. Again, this is localized to your account, right? So buffers will append hello world to it. Um, you can pipe out of it. I realize this is redundant, but it makes the piping out very clear. Um, so some of the things, the semantics of this, right, and I think this is maybe a little bit smaller, but hopefully you can see it, and I'll, I'll describe it for people that can't see it. Echo hello world, pipe it into buffers, and just do plus, which means append. Um, so now we ha our default buffer has hello world. We can look, we can peek inside it with equals, which we can do multiple times, right, to see what's in there. Um, or we can drain it with minus, which will, we get it, and then, you know, it's empty. So that's our default buffer. But you can also put stuff into named buffers, which is kind of nice to have multiple buffers. So put this in the foobar buffer. You can append multiple things into that foobar buffer. Uh, and then, and then drain it. So those are, the, that's the basic thing. Uh, two minutes. So, um, this is a cooler demo. Uh, basically showing how you can use it for like ad hoc coordination, you copying files. It's like a, like a clipboard on the command line that is across all machines. Um, but I don't have time for that. Uh, so buffers uh, will also have a web interface that gives you kind of a paste bin like interface to, to peek into your buffers. So um, 
you know, but it, it'll be real time. You can actually stream stuff into it. So you can imagine actually using buffers in command IO to make a poor man's CI. Um, and that's kind of the idea. If you want to play with buffers, again, sign up for command IO because that's sort of uh, where we're going to uh, let people play with it first. And a surprise technical bit because they pushed me to make this more technical, uh, which there isn't time for. How many of you are Go programmers? So I made something for you. Good building blocks are made out of good building blocks. So we finally built a high level SSH library. You probably have, you know, there's a stand, almost standard library SSH package, but it's actually much more low level. Um, we made one that we're using and we work, we're working with Bitbucket uh, on this and uh, it basically makes it as easy to make an SSH server as an HTTP server. This is the simplest server. Here's, here's a gateway, it's 115 lines. This is a gateway that gives you, uh, when you SSH into it, it puts you into a Docker container, which is just, you know, for fun. This is in the examples in that repo. Um, and then an example that I won't show. So some other things that we're going to build, sort of the next thing on the list is triggers, which is starting to get into all the things that I wanted to do with webhooks uh, over the last 10 years. So that's coming soon. But there's also basically 30 more things that I have on my list of things to build um, that we will be building. Uh, so that's exciting and hopefully they're useful. Um, so I guess as a call to action, if you want to join us, again, the point of this is that this is, this is just me and another person and our community. And so we really can't do this without people joining in and, and helping out in the same way that open source works. So, um, and it is all open source. So if you want to, you know, participate in this, right, it's very early on, you can join, uh, request access to command IO so we can, um, uh, cause that's sort of the best place to start and then join us on our, on our journey. So that's it. Uh, thank you.